Hey there, Internet. Welcome to part four of Snakes, Ladders, and Closure, the mechanics of sequential art. This is the best part, I'm telling you. We're going to look at snakes and ladders. And we're going to check out uh, first an example of traditional flow from Dream Life. And I warn you, some not safe for work language in that one. And then we're going to look at atypical flow, uh, a page that I broke the rules a little bit by experimenting with uh, the gutter width and some tangential flow tricks. You'll see when we get to it really soon. Then we're going to check out rolling transitions. That is the eighth kind of transition that I've added to the list that was initially started by Scott McCloud in Understanding Comics and Making Comics. And then uh, it was amended with a seventh by Jessica Abel and Matt Maiden in Drawing with Words, Writing with Pictures. And I've added an eighth too. I know, presumptuous of me, but it describes something that I do with my own comics, and you'll see when you get on with the rest of this clip. Remember that you can watch a full unedited version, the whole hour and 26 minutes of uh, unbroken uh, loveliness on Patreon at patreon.com slash salgood. Uh, pledge there to become a supporter of my work, a subscriber to my comics, and for a little more, a student patron. And then you can send me your work and get personalized feedback and tutelage. Remember that you can subscribe here on YouTube by hitting the subscribe button. And in the doobly-doo, you will see links to all of the materials I reference and talk about and everything else. So without further ado, here we go, the final installment of Snakes, Ladders, and Closure. So these are our fairly straightforward grid rhythms, left to right down, and how to move through the action. The, I always make, it always makes me think of uh, this old board game. It's called Snakes and Ladders. Uh, there's another version called Snakes and Shoots, or Shoots and Ladders, sorry. Uh, but it's the same idea. Uh, you have these ladders that you climb up the board with, and shoots or snakes that you slide down. It's a really old game, though. There were different versions of it. Here we have a spiral version of it. You win by getting to the middle. Uh, and there's another one here that's about uh, the, you know, I think it's about sins because you have avarice and pride and uh, depravity and vanity and pity are the various things, courteousness. Um, and then you have this sort of weird collection of snakes and ladders. Uh, I believe Snakes and Ladders is the original form, because all the old ones look like Snakes and Ladders. Here's another pair. So we have another non-conventional board with uh, Arabic themes, and another one with the biblical themes, uh, but a different arrangement, a different arrangement of Snakes and Ladders. So you slide down the snakes and up the ladders. And that's a lot of that's a way a lot of comics work, is that you use e either straight grids or overt devices to draw your eye and pull you around. Uh, some comics you'll actually see people using arrows to point the way. I feel like that works but it's a bit uh, ungraceful, it's a bit clumsy. So here's uh, where I start talking about some of the other things I do. So let's begin with a very traditional page that I did. This is Dream Life. Uh, sorry, language warning. Uh, notice the rhythm. I'm only using one word. First panel, shit. Second panel, shit. Third panel, snap, shit. Uh, guy calls him over, shit, it's expired. Shit, 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 she runs. Down the hall, out of breath. Comparative religions, and then in sticky notes, die white colonial scum. And the guy falls over, out of breath. It's actually most of that, but just sort of this feeling exhausted. Shit. So he's out of butter. He dropped his apple. The key broke off in his door, car door. He gets takes the transit. His transit is expired. He has to run to school. He's late for class, and he's out of breath before going in. Uh, the reading is fairly straightforward. It's left to right. There is action... Uh, designed to pull you in an interesting way. So the angle of the empty butter tray leads you up, and then you have the apple bouncing down, and then up to right where the key snaps off in the door, and down to the yelling shit. And so we're on downward movement. So we go down to the next row, and we see, uh, this is Lionel, by the way, is the character, and he looks over the guy signaling to come over there, and then we see the, tra the, the streetcar leaving the panel as he looks down at, at his transit card and, and the little sign that says expired. And then he's running across, and we've got the chit, 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 that is a gap, right? And he's off to the far, the, all the lead space is behind him, so he's leaving the panel. Then he's going off into down the hallway away from us, and finally he's a little red-faced and looking at the sign and noticing the sticky notes and noticing the time. And he's tired. We have very straight flow, flow, and there's also the way he's looking back when he's tired. It creates a bit of a circular relationship with the second, last, and last panel. So it's a bit of a quiet moment, creates a pause. That's a fairly traditional comics page. Uh, left to right flow, page design to lead you in a, 
emphasize, but lead you in a traditional way. So on other pages on this book, I kind of hijacked it. The next one I'm going to show you is still a grid, but I wanted to fool you on purpose. So when you first read this, your no normal inclination is to go left to right. But notice the extra wide gutters. And they're evenly extra wide everywhere. Uh, so you will read it left to right. You see a leaf. Guy's on a bridge. Says, oh, well, OK. He's drowning, pulls out of the water. We see the leaf again, closer. Woman on the bridge with him. He's un falling under the water. Woman holding him. Bridge, uh, leaf has a bridge on it. Guy's foot in the water. Woman screaming, no, they're floating in the air. You get the idea, it keeps going. It's weird and non sequitur, right? But it isn't really. It's a dream. And I wanted to induce that kind of strange, unsettling dream logic. So it was designed for you to misread it the first time. Uh, I take advantage of the fact that culturally we're all likely to go left to right first. And we'll do that. But then once you're confused, you'll look at it again. And then you might notice the intentionally placed tangents creating flow to make you go down instead of left to right. So the leaf, the tail of the leaf, tends perfectly to the shape of the leaf in the, in the beginning of the next row, which then points to the top corner where the river starts at the top of the close-up of the leaf. You can see the cells on a bridge, and then you come in tight, and there's a zigzagging moment all the way down, movement all the way down that row that's meant to be nice and fluid. And you can see it's actually a steady truck in on the leaf, and it has the leaf has a bridge over a river, and then our character Linus is laying on a bridge and he's saying, ah, well, and the woman looks back at him and his water, the water is going through his toes. And she says, you should be nice to me. I'm in my higher cycle. And he says, okay, as the water is coming over the bridge and over him, and he just seems calmly letting it happen. And then she's no, and grabs him and pulls him out and hugs him and they float into space and she says something, but we can't hear it. So it's intended to be a little bit uh, odd not undecipherable. I, I, the keys are there. I wanted them to be findable. But I wanted to throw you at first because I want you to realize that he's fallen asleep during the lecture and he's having a weird dream. So there is the actual page flow. Go back again for a second. There's the page flow you're likely to read the first time. But there's the actual page flow. Down and then up and then down and then up and then down. So that's one way in which you can hijack the grid. But you need to have evidence there. The snakes and ladders route works, and I've basically created snakes and ladders. The shape of the leaves and the way the art, you see the, the red arrows in, on, on the right here, those are my snakes and ladders. Um, in this case, uh, these would be snakes because they're pulling you down. Uh, but the thing is, I haven't made them overt. There's no arrows actually in the art. The actual page doesn't need them. It's designed to be a little bit ambiguous, and I could have been more overt about it. I could have made the vertical panels closer together and the column gutters wider, and then people would have gotten it right away. They would have seen right away that I had a row of columns to be read vertically. Uh, I made the spacing universal and wide everywhere to intentionally, as I said at the beginning, induce a bit of confusion. But then there are pages where I want to get even further away from the grid. And this is where we get to this additional eighth transition type that I've named in order to discuss it in classes. So pardon the pretension, but rolling transitions. This is something I do a lot. Before I ever had a name for it, I thought of as montages. Uh, then I got, saw Diego Rivera's work at the Detroit Institute of Art and the, the great Ford murals. And I studied more of his work. And it gave me lots of ideas about how to do this even more intensely. Uh, here we have two panels from a story called Helpless and a panel from Dream Life. Or pages, should be, these are pages, sorry. Pa two panels from Helpless and a page from Dream Life. The two panels from Helpless was written by uh, A.J. Durek. This is a story about a woman dealing with uh, ailment and infirmity. And the first floor neighbor is an ancient 90-year-old man who sits in the front stoop and his apartment reeks of piss in the summer. And he's nice enough and everything, but confronting him each day just reminds her of her mortality. And, and she's dealing with health issues, so every time she f sees him, she feels awkward and comfortable and is brought to think about her own problems again. And, is, and this story is all about her angst of dealing with her neighbor and thinking about her situation and thinking about mortality. So here we have, it's three panels basically on the far left as she's coming down the stairs and talks about encountering him each day and the strong smell coming from his apartment. And you notice that the the actual, there is no real gutters here, but the transition between the panels is essentially the railing of the staircase. There's bleed over. So under the railing in the first panel, 
we can see hints of the wall in the second panel, but also hints of her uh, coming down the stairs. And then under the railing in the second panel, we see hints of her, but then also hints of the background of the third panel. So it bleeds together and overlaps and flows together. And the angles change. Our camera angle starts with a, a, a high overhead bird's eye shot to coming in close, still technically overhead, like you were in a drone or something, dropping down, to level at the street as we come down level, so that your angle flows down as you flow down the page, creating a nice fluid sense of motion. Uh, notice the eye line in the art is C-shaped, following the woman's uh, movement through the page. So it starts in the top left, and there's a gap. The, the text floats around the arch created through, if you pass through the woman's figure, all through three panels. You make a C shape, a reverse, uh, technically a reverse C uh, shape arch. Okay? And then the C shape, actual C shape, so starting in the right and back down to the left and to the right again, is the text. So you encounter the text, but it's not confrontational as she thinks about all these things that dwell on her mind. You can read this comic on my website, by the way. It's up, It's listed as, it's up, up as a, a free web comic there, and you can get it in Revolver, my, my digital anthology. The first issue of Revolver has it. Um, the next page is this next page in the story, and here she's becoming more intensely uh, uh, self-confronted by her guilt and her con uh, issues with this whole experience. Um, so you see close with the old man, long shot of the woman kind of waving and then notice how the big chunk of dark uh, frame text breaks the panel to the next panel below and that's where I talked about like confronting when you have intense conflictual text here she's expressing her sense of guilt and anxiety and so that text is unavoidable and it's right in the root down to the next shot of her and then her walking down the street and notice that I got you to read in a reverse C pattern again, and against the reading flow. So the last panel is the distant long shot of her walking down the street. Um, the other page was a scene from Dream Life. It depicts a really intense moment. This is an assault. Uh, she's been dragged off into the woods by a couple of people she got a hitchhiking ride from, and it's about to be sexual assault, but she gets the ga gun from this character and hits him in the head. Um, I wanted to have this scene not turn into a, a fight action sequence. I wanted it to be very intense, but not drawn out and be choreographed kung fu martial arty moment. So I've used this montage collaging flow, and if you look closely, you'll see how like the arms bleed together. We focus on her face first, and then there's the guy over her's arm holding the gun, and her arm reaching up to the gun, and then we go up to them wrestling, and then we come in and see her arm swinging by and hitting the guy in the face, and then she realizes she has the gun in her hand. And the arms in the middle all interweave like an Escher drawing, creating no clear sense of where panels stop and start. And then we drop down with the movement of her dropping the gun on the guy's forehead. Whack. So the physical direction movement. Now, if you'll note that this is a spiral. Uh, it's actually pretty close to being a Fibonacci spiral or a golden mean spiral. I wasn't trying to do that, but it's roughly the, the degree in which it unwinds. Um, it, 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 uh, it invites potentially circular reading, but it gets the action over really quickly in a chaotic manner that I think uh, cor correctly uh, mimics the way conflict and fighting actually feels whenever I've been in a fight. Not that many, but as a kid, it happened to me for a bit, and I remember it being chaotic, and it was over. Uh, so we don't really clear where people end and start. Uh, we the confusion of the moment and the surprise that she has a gun in her hand. She realizes she's gotten hold of it. It doesn't feel very purposeful because it's not supposed to be. She just reached up and ended up grabbing it, and then now she realizes she has it and she hits him with it. Uh, and the various arrows indicate. There's some various options, and then once you get down to the bottom moment, uh, the the her swing echoes the downwards movement of your eye, and then there's a zigzag movement through the figure. Her fi foot's kicking up, and there's a silhouette of that second guy that appears at the top of the page uh, that could suggest you go back up and revisit the idea, or you could go the way her hair kind of feeds into the dry leaves on the, on the ground and then to the bark of the tree and back up into all the action. This page could be read circularly. I've also abandoned any hard borders. It's not a bleed page, but it also doesn't have panel borders. So it, it kind of is self-contained and there's lots of flowing action with the, the rough edges around it. The, the leaves create an irregular edge. So 
it's meant to be chaotic and high energy and impactful without sensationalizing or kind of glorifying the, the violence. Here's a scene, it's a bar. Uh, the poetry is meant to be read kind of in a Tom Waits voice. So back in the booth, Rudy Rochelle, bitches and burps most nights, welching and belching and carrying on in a blue way till Mannerful Kent refills the tab, lemon tonics with little pink umbrellas. Liquor before beer will get you there quicker, or is it the other? And it's drink-a-rink-dink till the early dogs yawn, bored with the show because you know you know. Round 3 a.m., Lori sighs of longing and hauls his frame out of the barca lounger, scratching Fufu's ear, causing a leg to jackhammer in an embarrassing manner. Clear out, you dirtbags. It's time to go to sleep and dream of clean glasses. Arriving, one should be directed to the salesman of hammer point ties, painted per foot. And on it goes. So it's a silly kind of limericky poem. The strange little bit of poetry at the end I actually achieved by running through Google Translator like three or four times and then cleaning it up a little bit. It's not meant to make any sense. It's silly. Uh, I wanted a drunken, no nauseous, sloshing feel to the way you read the page. So you'll notice how like the in the first panel, the, the edge of the booth becomes the top of the second panel, and then the foreground figures are somewhere like a third panel, and then we have um, Lori is this big bouncer, his arm, a framing device that leads us up to the dog getting his ear scratched, and then back down to Lori, and then in Lori's shirt we see the last panel, uh, our character George giving his, is actually the deadbeat, but... George the Deadbeat uh, is giving his little weird poem at the finale. There's several pages. It was in uh, Pop Gun 4. It's called Honolulu Lori's Love, Love, Lava Loves Lounge and Poodle Emporium. And it's definitely a love letter to Tom Waits and that kind of weird poetry. Um, and it's, it's all fluid, rolling transitions. There are no clear gutters. There are no clear breaks in time. The eye just sort of rolls into the next panel and folds through space and I'm folding space and time you know in itself is what I, I'm trying to do with this sort of stuff so here we have another dream life page and a page from therefore a pen um, the first one is an argument between a couple it is not about the carpet the carpet is the subject of the argument the carpet is the middle of the page but it is not about the carpet it's about their dying relationship really and their lack of trust and his uptightness and distrust of her lifestyle and to be fair, she is a part-time drug dealer and full-time psychologist, which is kind of conflictual. Um, so the dialogue is, uh, did, you get, did you get a new rug? Oh, yeah, I found that uh, stateside to wrap the stuff up in. Uh, we told the customs we had been flea marketing, got it for less than 100 too, so no duty. You smuggled drugs in it? Well, yeah, of course. Why would you bring it into the apartment? What if it's like covered in contraband residue? Oh, good lord. It was LSD in pills, in packets, in plastic, in bags. I thought I'd put it in the hall downstairs, spruce up the boys' space a bit. I suppose, so long as it's not up here, I can feel it tainting the spirit of the apartment. Well, if the fucking carpet is enough to do that, what must I do to the place? Um, so, this is all about the dynamic of the couple. It's, I wanted to get across what they're about and how they're not working very well. Uh, remember I talked about eye lines and the text colliding when it's confrontational? So at the beginning, they're, they're not getting along, but it's not so confrontational. So you, you see the guy standing in the door in the chair with the carpet sitting on it, and you flow right into her cooking in front of the stove. And she's looking a little snarky, but she's not angry yet. And we flow up to him reacting to what she said. You smuggle drugs in it, and then we drop down. And now the text is in your way. There is no eye line that doesn't require you to heat, hit the text. When she says, well, yeah, of course. Why would you bring it in the apartment? And then the text constantly gets in your way. And we have a moment, the gap in the middle, where we see the carpet. We can consider the carpet for a minute. And I'm inviting you to look at it and think, this isn't really about the carpet, is it? And then it goes on, and it's confirmed at the end when she says, what must I do to the place? Um, so this is a rolling transition that's meant to keep, get across the dynamics of the relationship. And we're... We're kind of floating around the space, taking in the situation. It's kind of aspect to aspect and subject to subject transitions, uh, but they're all these rolling transitions. There's no clear gutters. There's no real clear panels. It all flows together. The other panel page, I should say, is from the beginning of Therefore Repent, and, and we're actually getting the view of uh, an angel 
flying over Chicago. And you can see the shadow of the angel's wing in the first panel there, scaring somebody. And then there's a view of a, what's going to be a very important house and a woman in a bird's hat. A bird's head, oh, sorry, a bird head mask. And she's actually a key figure. We'll find out later on. Um, and it, it's it, one of my early experiences rolling transitions. So there's just sort of blurry boundaries between the moments, but it gets a kind of swooping, flowing, flying feeling across. So you can use these sort of transitions different ways. Again, I really like these, but I mean, in the end, they're hard to design and make work well. So it's not, this is not a condemnation of things like a grid. A good six panel grid is so much easier to design and work with. So I don't, I'm not putting those down, but getting away from grid layouts was something I really wanted to do because I don't experience life in a grid. Uh, it's sort of one blurry moment into another blurry moment. And I wanted to find a way to get that on a page in comics. So that's where I started playing with and, in, and inventing different ways to use rolling transitions. Here's a couple more, two pages from The Rise and Fall of It All. Uh, it's a poetic jazz story about a man who becomes homeless. This is in Chicago, and we flow through Chicago's downtown in the loop and out to the west side uh, as a jazz horn player's music passes through us like a phantom. And then on the far right, we're someone considering cracks in the sidewalk and scooping up the gravel with their hands. So I think you get the idea. Uh, these I've illustrated in, in this talk all of the key components to sequential storytelling and visual storytelling. And, and with these rolling transitions, some of the ways in which I like to break the rules a little bit. Uh, I push you out of your usual left to right flow sometimes. Uh, I do a lot of vertical. So if you look at these two examples, the, both of them are actually direct down. There's a bit of left to right but it's kind of a diagonal down left to right and we're zigzagging down more than we are going left to right down left to right down left to right down and the the right page here has no text on the page but there is some text and it would be just going down uh, I think that the vertical stacking is a little tricky because you usually you can't get as much density you can't get as many panels in that way but it's a very naturalistic flow uh, and it allows you to have these really fluid rolling transitions easily. You can go left to right and left to right, uh, right to left on it, uh, but you have to have features designed into the, to the choreography, into the composition of the art that make it self-evident. You could resort to snakes and ladders, some sort of overt thing like an arrow or maybe an actual snake and ladder, but that's less subtle. It's better when the person reads the page and doesn't have to think about how they're supposed to go to the next panel. It's just there. It's, it's self-evident. Um, and the thing that'll always trip you up, even with a standard grid, if you get your word balloons in the wrong place, or you get your grid relationships wrong, your, your gutter widths are too irregular, the thing that'll always trip you up is when, you, by doing that, you create a less obvious reading flow. And then your readers aren't sure what to do next. And then read things out of the wrong, right order. Or miss a word balloon, or, or generally, or just feel a bit unsettled by the page design. So whether you go with a really traditional, what's called like a storyboard page with just a straight grid, or with you, you play with my more experimental uh, adventures here, make sure to make it clear to the reader what they're supposed to do. If you need to resort to arrows and pointers and little fingers pointing the way, do so. Uh, if you can try to make it subtle and integrated into the inherent design of the page, so that it's just evident when you look at it, what's supposed to happen next. That's what you should really aspire to. Uh, test your pages, show them to people and say, what do you think, how you, you know, just like Neil Cohen did with his studies, how do you think you should read this? Where would you go next? And don't coach them or correct them, just find out what they say and then take note and then ask somebody else and, you know, go for three or four if you can manage it and tabulate the responses. With the internet now, it should be pretty easy to do if you don't mind posting this stuff in progress to uh, a select group of friends, perhaps. Uh, and uh, that's it. You know, this is all very potentially complicated seeming. It doesn't have to be. Again, resort to a grid if you want to keep it simple. Um, comics can be really elegant and simple. They are potentially infinitely complex if you want to make them that way and infinitely deep. And that's what I love about the medium. It appeals to my uh, uh, engineering scientific mind to kind of mess with things and find new efficiencies and new ways of doing stuff. But I also just like the, the simplicity of the basic structure. Uh, have fun with them. Enjoy them. If you're interested in more of this, subscribe to my channel. If you're a Patreon patron, you've been enjoying the unedited version of this. And congratulations to you. And thank you very much for your support. If you are not yet a Patreon, check out patreon.com slash salgood and consider pledging 
to help me make more comics, and for a little more, you can become a student patron and send me your homework to get tutelage and feedback. If you happen to live in Montreal, you also have the option of signing up at sinstudio.ca, that's S-Y-N studio.ca, to my Making Comics class and taking my course in person. It's a 10-week class, uh, intensive uh, crash course in all the basics of making comics. I also have a cartooning class and dynamic drawing, which is a general gesture-based drawing class. Um, if you're in Montreal and you become a patron, you'll also be able to meet with me in person as well. One final reminder that many of the visuals you've seen and some of the ideas that I talked about have their origins with Scott McCloud's amazing book, Understanding Comics, and the follow-up, Making Comics, which you should definitely check out. And I highly recommend Jessica Abel and Matt Maiden's Drawing with Words, Writing with Pictures, as well as Mastering Comics. Both are excellent resources as well if you want to really learn how this medium works. Making Comics and Jessica Amel Matt Maiden's books are all designed as course books, so you can teach yourself using them. So that's it for now. I will see you around. Again, don't forget to subscribe to get all my videos. And thanks for watching. Remember that this is part four. Uh, part ones, two, and three are all in the feed. Check them out. Watch it all. And learn how to make your comics sing.